This is the Grace Gospel Fellowship. In their church directory as of late 2020, they list 107 member churches. The fellowship acted simply as an association of pastors from their founding in 1944 until 1971 when a governing body was formed and a president was elected. The GGF doesn't view themselves as a denomination. Their website states, Though GGF is not a denomination, our churches and pastors recognize the importance of partnering with one another as members of the body of Christ. In a spirit of interdependence, we seek to work in harmony as churches and individuals on a national level within our geographical regions and locally. We also have an international outreach through our affiliated mission agencies. Before we examine the doctrine of the GGF, let's look at their affiliations so we can see who we're talking about. On their affiliated ministries page, they list, among others, Grace Christian University, Grace Ministries International, and Grace Publications. They also have a page that lists, as they call it, other Grace organizations, which includes Berean Bible Society, St. Louis Theological Seminary, and Grace Gospel Publishers. Sometimes when looking at groups of churches, it can be very difficult to determine what they believe. But Grace Gospel Fellowship is helpfully very straightforward about what they believe and teach. Most of what they teach would put them in line with conservative evangelical and fundamentalist churches. I'll start by listing the beliefs they have that are in alignment with other churches in that category, and then we'll move to their more distinctive beliefs that make them different. GGF believes in the inspiration and inerrancy of the 66 books of the Old and New Testaments of the Bible, holding them as the final authority for faith and practice. They affirm the Trinity, Christ's deity, virgin birth, substitutionary death, bodily resurrection, and future return. A pre-tribulation rapture and literal millennial kingdom are held to, a literal Adam and Eve, the human sin nature, and salvation by grace through faith alone. Additionally, the GGF teaches that salvation cannot be lost, that abortion is sinful, and that marriage is between one man and one woman. They believe in a literal heaven and hell, and don't believe in mandatory tithing. Most dispensationalists that are not mid-acts, like the GGF, refer to Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20 as the Great Commission, where Christ told his disciples to teach and baptize all nations. The GGF doesn't accept this passage as being a command of the church today. The GGF is cessationist, teaching that certain of the miraculous spiritual gifts have ceased and that the offices of apostle and prophet are no longer operational. They practice observance of the Lord's Supper, viewing it as a symbolic memorial only. Now, let's look at some more distinct beliefs of the GGF. First, they are dispensational. There are several different theological frameworks by which different churches have explained the bigger picture of the Bible, such as the relation of the Old and New Testaments, its applicability to believers today, and the roles of the church and the nation of Israel. Covenant theology is one such framework, and another is dispensationalism. The specific type of dispensationalism of the GGF, though, is what differentiates them from the rest of Christianity, evangelicalism, and fundamentalism. The GGF holds to mid-acts dispensationalism. In brief, this view teaches that in the same way the commands and teachings of the Old Testament law are not intended to be applied to Christians today, since they were not given to us, that some of the books of the New Testament are also not intended to be applied to churches today, but rather were given to others. Mid-Acts Dispensationalism doesn't believe that these books aren't scripture or that they aren't useful, just that they aren't directed to non-Jewish Christians. This Mid-Acts Dispensational view leads to all of the other distinctive views as well, and here's a quick list of some of the distinctives. The church didn't begin until the time that is covered in the middle of Acts. This is most commonly believed to be in Acts 9 or Acts 13. Paul the Apostle is the only apostle to the Gentiles and to the church of this dispensation. The other 12 apostles were not part of the church, the body of Christ. Some mid-Acts dispensationalists disagree with this one. The church, which is the body of Christ, was the mystery revealed to Paul. The writings of those other than Paul in the New Testament, such as the Gospels or other apostles' works and the doctrine in them, are not for the church. Baptism in water was a ceremonial ordinance for Jewish Christians and should not be practiced today. The only baptism today is Holy Spirit baptism. The gospel preached by Paul is the gospel of the grace of God, different from the gospel of the kingdom preached by Christ and the apostles. Today, we are saved by grace through faith, but previous dispensations had a plan of salvation that included works. Here's what the GGF and other mid-Acts dispensationalists have to say on each of these points. First, the church didn't begin until the time that is covered in the middle of Acts. The GGF doctrinal statement says, God's specific truth of and for this church was first revealed through the Apostle Paul. This church began historically with Paul before the writing of his first epistle. 
Kenneth B. Kemper, president of Grace Christian University, says in the article, Grace, Our Message, Our Theology, and Our Practice, published in Truth Magazine, Our theology and understanding from Scripture for the present dispensational character of the Church as a distinctive Pauline revelation after Pentecost is our distinguishing attribute. Many but not all other Christians view the Church as starting at Pentecost, which is rejected by the GGF. One clarification I must make is that many mid-Acts dispensationalists will recognize a separate Jewish Christian church that existed before the time frame of the middle of Acts, but view that church has now ceased. Now we have this new church in which is no difference between Jew and Gentile. This church began in mid-Acts. On the point, Paul the Apostle is the only apostle to the Gentiles and to the church of this dispensation, Philip J. Long, Grace Bible College professor, writes for the article, A Brief Introduction to the New Perspective on Paul, in the Journal of Grace Theology, Paul seems rather clear in Galatians he was called by God to be the apostle to the Gentiles in a way quite distinct from the apostles in Jerusalem. Paul stresses his independence clearly in Galatians. He never joins the Jerusalem church, nor does he receive his commission from them, but he is called by God to do a different task than the twelve. He is the apostle to the Gentiles. Writing in Truth Magazine, Pastor Scott Myers said, God is blessing the nations despite Israel's disbelief through the plan he kept secret from before the world began, the mystery, Ephesians 3 verses 3 through 9, revealed to and made known by his handpicked apostle to the Gentiles. And we are the fruit of that commission. What the Lord Jesus began with the apostle Paul, he continues to work out today through the church, the body of Christ, those who have received the grace commission. On the topic of the other 12 apostles were not part of the church, the body of Christ, Robert Williams, pastor of Grace Bible Church in Anaheim, California, writes in the Journal of Grace Theology, The 12, as well as those under their ministry, never did become members of the body of Christ, but continued with their own ministry, under their own teaching, until they all died out or until the destruction of Jerusalem made it impossible for them to continue with their religious program. On the church, which is the body of Christ, was the mystery revealed to Paul. Frosty Hansen, a missionary to Bolivia sent by Grace Ministries International and former president of Grace Gospel Fellowship for 12 years, writes in Truth Magazine, In Ephesians 3, Paul speaks of this unique revelation where he repeatedly mentions the mystery, a secret previously which God only now makes known through him. It's important to note that this mystery, from the beginning of the ages, has been hidden in God. In other words, not revealed, not in the Old Testament scriptures, not in the gospel, nor anywhere else. It was a secret known only to God. Yet when the proper time came, God revealed this secret to Paul so that he would then make it known to us through his inspired writings. As Paul shared his testimony in Galatians, he emphasized that his message is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul is emphasizing that this is not something he is making up, He did not learn it from the other apostles, nor any written or oral tradition. He received his message by direct revelation from Jesus Christ, thus making it the word of God. It was a secret until Christ revealed it to Paul. What exactly is the mystery? To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs with Israel and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Never before did such a relationship exist between Israel and the Gentiles. This is a new and unique relationship in which God makes one new man from the two, the body of Christ. This new man, this new relationship, this new church, the body of Christ, is the mystery. As part of this teaching, it may be taught that there was no ministry to the Gentiles until Acts chapter 9. On the writings of those other than Paul in the New Testament, such as the Gospels or other apostles and the doctrine in them, are not for the church, Robert Williams, near the end of the same article quoted before, says, Certainly, some of the truth that began in the Gospels and continued through the book of Acts and into the Hebrew Christian epistles are not compatible with what Paul teaches in his epistles. It is quite liberating when we recognize that Paul's epistles and the Hebrew Christian epistles represent two different programs of God. Instead of trying to somehow interpret certain portions of Scripture, such as James 2.14, 21 through 26, in such a way as to make them compatible with Paul, such as Romans 3, verses 24 through 28, We are now free to take these portions of Scripture to mean exactly what they say. The Grace Gospel Fellowship's doctrinal statement says the following under the heading of Dispensations. We find in Paul's writings alone the revelation, position, and destiny of the church. This is repeated and explained more by GGF's booklet, Roots That Give Life. 
Since Paul was God's chosen instrument to reveal this hidden plan regarding the body of Christ, it is no surprise that it is in his writings alone we find the revelation, position, and destiny of the church. The special nature of Paul's writings to the body of Christ does not mean that these are somehow more inspired than all other biblical texts. Indeed, Paul himself emphasized that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and all scripture is profitable. We commit a tremendous error and do ourselves great harm when we discount or fail to read and study any portion of God's word. Yet we must do so in light of God's current revelation through Paul to the body of Christ. This chart on the website of the Berean Bible Institute shows the division of the New Testament by mid-Acts dispensationalists. Paul's epistles are called out as being for the present dispensation. The Gospels are put into the previous one. Acts is shown as a transition, and the books after Philemon are titled as Kingdom Epistles for Last Day Saints. On Baptism in Water was a ceremonial ordinance for Jewish Christians and should not be practiced today, and the only baptism is Holy Spirit baptism, the GGF doctrinal statement says, We believe that the Holy Spirit places all believers into the body of Christ at the moment of salvation by one spiritual baptism. Through this work of the Holy Spirit, we are identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. The Bible also speaks of other baptisms. Some are spiritual in nature, and others were ritualistic and played a key part in God's program with Israel. While those baptisms all had importance in the past, Scripture speaks of this divine baptism as the one and only baptism that is operative today. Therefore, we practice no other baptism. We emphasize this spiritual baptism as foundational to the unity of all believers. On the gospel preached by Paul is the gospel of the grace of God, different from the gospel of the kingdom preached by Christ and the apostles, an article written by Charles F. Baker on the Berean Bible Society website says, A contrast between the kingdom gospel and the grace gospel is seen in what Peter preached to Cornelius. God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. And in what Paul preached to Gentiles, For by grace are ye saved through faith, not of works. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. As long as this kingdom gospel was preached, the order was to the Jew first, and water baptism and other Jewish ceremonies were practiced. But after Paul had carried this message to the leaders of the dispersion in Rome, and they had rejected it, God definitely set aside the Jewish nation, along with the gospel of the kingdom, and made known to Paul the full revelation of the mystery of the gospel of the grace of God, which was to accompany it. The Grace Gospel Fellowship and the organizations mentioned are not the only mid-Acts dispensationalists. There's a sizable group of them who, unlike the GGF, teach using the King James Version of the Bible exclusively in English, including a ministry called Grace Ambassadors. Grace Ambassadors also teaches that practicing the Lord's Supper with the bread and cup is not for the current dispensation. There may be some differences in what mid-Acts dispensationalists teach regarding how people were saved before the existence of the church or in previous dispensations. Some, but not all, teach that works or water baptism were part of salvation prior to the revelation of the mystery to Paul. Mid-Acts churches generally follow one of a few standard naming practices. The words grace and Berean are very common in the name, and Bible church, Bible fellowship, and community church are typical identifiers, although these names are also used by churches that are not Mid-Acts dispensational. Additionally, there are dispensationalists who are not mid-Acts that may also use the terms of grace believers or right dividers.